Welcome. I hope you are having a wonderful night, dear viewer. Tonight, I will be telling some terrifyingly scary stories. Make sure to leave your feedback on the comments so I can make this the best experience for you. And if you have any stories you would like me to tell, you can send them through the link in the description. Let's begin. I found myself driving down a desolate road, raindrops splattering against the windshield in a chaotic symphony. Fatigue had set in, my eyelids heavy, and my grip on the steering wheel slipping. It was in that moment, a mere heartbeat away from disaster. My body tensed as the blinding headlights of an oncoming car careened toward me, seemingly out of nowhere. Instinctively, I swerved to avoid the collision my heart pounding in my chest like a tribal drum. Time seemed to slow as my car skidded, tires screeching in protest against the wet asphalt. Miraculously, I managed to avoid the collision, but the car behind me careened off the road, disappearing into the night. Shaking with adrenaline, I pulled over and got out, expecting to see the wreckage and injured passengers. But to my utter confusion, there was no trace of the accident, no mangled metal, no broken glass, just an empty road stretching into the distance. After a long pause of panic and confusion, I continued on my way. The rain subsided as I arrived home. The next morning, I woke up as usual with the immediate need to relieve my bladder. After taking a quick glance in the mirror while washing my hands, I paused and turned my head left to right, carefully inspecting my facial features. My reflection in the bathroom mirror appeared subtly altered, with my eyes appearing darker and my jawline slightly sharper. Did I lose weight? Huh, I didn't even notice. I thought to myself. Gleaming with a boost of self-confidence, I got dressed and ventured outside, even though I couldn't find my phone. I had plans to meet up with friends at the bowling alley, and not being able to find my phone wouldn't be a good enough excuse for them to not kill me for bailing. They took bowling seriously. When I arrived, I immediately noticed something peculiar about them. Let me explain why this is peculiar. I just saw both Dan and Kate three days ago, but their appearances had noticeably changed. Kate had newly dyed her hair a vibrant shade of blue, and Dan now suddenly had a man bun, when I could have sworn he had short hair just three days ago. Kate wasn't even going to ask my thoughts on her newly dyed hair. I pondered. Curiosity and concern welled up inside, and I couldn't resist mentioning the changes. Hey, I like your new hair color, I exclaimed, pointing at Kate's blue hair. And since when did your hair get long enough to be put in a bun? Dan, my friend scoffed. New? I've had this hair color for months. You really don't pay enough attention to us, do you? Kate replied, rolling her eyes. I've been growing my hair out for like six months and I didn't exactly hide it. Are you feeling okay? Sincerely asked, I blinked, trying to dismiss it and laugh it off, but the disconcerting feeling wouldn't go away. Even the way they spoke, their voices felt slightly altered. It sent a chill down my spine. I thought I was losing my mind, my anxiety playing cruel tricks on me. I tried to rationalize the changes, convincing myself that stress was distorting my perception. But no, something was not right. I made up some excuse about needing to pick up my mom's prescription for her before the pharmacy closed and left abruptly. However, as the evening continued, my sense of unease grew stronger. I reached into my jacket pocket, searching for my phone again to no avail. Where did I leave that fucking thing? I muttered to myself, but something else felt off. The zipper, which had always been on the right side of my coat pocket, was now on the left. It was a small detail, but it felt profoundly wrong. But the anomalies persisted. I felt more disoriented and frightened, struggling to make sense of what was happening. People around me spoke with slight differences in their speech patterns. Their voices subtly altered. The once familiar world now felt like a distorted reflection in a funhouse mirror. I was no longer able to brush off the changes as mere figments of my imagination. I plunged into a state of paranoia, 
questioning my sanity. I wondered if my mind had been irreparably shattered by the near collision. Days bled together, and the anomalies multiplied. I couldn't remember what was normal and what was slightly different. The fabric of my existence felt unraveled by forces I couldn't comprehend. It's been days since I even left the house or talked to anyone. So in a desperate attempt to regain some semblance of normalcy, I retraced my steps, returning to the place where the near crash had occurred. It was a desolate stretch of road, haunted by memories of that fateful night. The rain had long ceased, but the atmosphere remained heavy with an eerie stillness. As I stepped out of the car, a strange glimmer caught my eye amidst the damp grass. There, lying partially buried, was a phone. An inexplicable mixture of hope and dread swelled within me as I picked it up. The screen flickered to life, illuminating my face with an eerie glow. To my disbelief, it was my missing phone, the very device that had vanished without a trace. The screen displayed a 13% charge remaining, not bad considering it had been here for so long. I had countless missed calls and notifications, all from the past few days. I began to scroll through the messages and notifications, desperately seeking answers. With trembling hands, I first opened up Facebook, which weirdly had 99's notifications, and my heart sank in disbelief as I read the first few posts on my feed. Rest in peace, and we miss you posts flooded my timeline from friends and family, apparently mourning my supposed demise. So far, I've been on three dates. Three different people. Three different dates. The first person was Max. Exceptionally tall and slim. We went out to a restaurant and talked all night about things that I can't recall. Every word seemed so important that I felt the need to linger on it for a while. But the subjects changed so rapidly and so fluidly like a flowing river. He presented himself in a charming manner, subtly flirting with me, and yet still not being overtly forward. We both enjoyed the night and made plans to catch up sometime in the near future. He was found early the next day. His heart was removed from his body and was never found. Needless to say, that shook me. I had never had a death impact me that hard. The gruesomeness of it all felt like a punch to the gut. I felt as if I was stuck in a rut with no way of clambering out. I had found someone that, for the first time, I had felt such a strong connection to. He seemed to be the perfect man, and now he was gone, cruelly taken from this world. Sleep was hard to come by, and my tears flowed freely. Then I met Evan. He was of a middling size. His physique not as appealing as Max's, but he was extremely intelligent and humorous enough to make up for it. We went to the cinemas for a first date and had to leave halfway through the movie on account of the fits of laughter he would send me into. We instead made our way to a nearby park, talking and laughing and having a great time. I left cheerful and brimming with hope that Evan would be the key to helping me move on. He was found at home, sprawled on the floor. His heart was removed. The detective I spoke with mentioned that the incisions were perfectly straight cutting in ways that a simple knife wouldn't be able to do. One death could be written off as a coincidence. Things like these do happen, but two. Something else was going on, and the correlating factor seemed to be dating me. And so when Matthew asked me out, I was hesitant. But he was persistent. He knew full well what had happened to my other dates, and was confident that he could take care of himself. Standing at 6'5", he was a mountain of a man, after all. It was a simple evening. We ordered in pizza at his apartment and watched Netflix, that new show everyone is talking about. It was the most amazing experience I ever had, and judging by the way Matthew performed, he definitely wasn't a first. Heimer, leaving his house, I felt happy and fulfilled, but worried. He was found outside a gym, his heart removed. Another chat with the detective revealed that this was the most brutal of the attacks. While both Evan and Max were killed instantly, 
An autopsy revealed Matthew was kept alive for hours and tortured to the point of collapsing. The bruises that covered his body painted a tale of unimaginable horror. The police began to question me more, as there were three suspicious deaths all related to me. I retreated inside myself and rarely left the house for anything. Life became bleak and worthless. Everything just seemed meaningless. I was terrified to meet new people, afraid that even them saying hello to me would result in their death. I was scared that the killer would choose me as their next victim, subjugating me to all manner of vile acts. My life was a danger to anyone I loved, and so I would not allow myself to love anymore. Retreating inside my house was the only viable option. I opened my door yesterday to a bouquet of flowers. I let out a half-hearted smile, realizing that someone was trying to cheer me up, most likely a worried family member, touched by the thoughtfulness. I picked up the flowers and tried to find a vase somewhere in my house to place them in. As I was walking through my house, three pieces of paper fluttered out of the flowers and onto the ground. Furrowing my brow, I picked them up and took a closer look at them. On each piece of paper was a Polaroid photo of a human heart. And on the back of each photo was a message, scribbled in pen. Only my heart belongs to you. I stepped onto the front porch, holding out hope that there would be a basket of pastries and cookies. To my disappointment, there was nothing there. It had been two weeks since the Gibsons had last visited. The Gibsons! Our neighbors from the farm next to ours had more land than our family, and they were truly amazing. Melvin and Maya, an elderly couple, used to bake together. One of the few things Melvin could remember due to his slipping memory. They always brought us delicious treats, and in return, we helped them with tasks around their farm. Maya's mind remained sharp, even as their bodies grew weaker. We felt it was the least we could do for such wonderful neighbors. However, when more than a week passed without any calls or basket drop-offs, I knew something was wrong. As I hurriedly put on some boots, my mom asked where I was going, reminding me that the sun was almost down. Check in on the neighbors, I replied, my face filled with concern. But I'm sure they're just fine. Their son and his wife were supposed to be visiting, right? My mom reassured me. I didn't have a proper response. Something felt off, but maybe I was overreacting. If they had family over, I shouldn't be so worried. Maybe you're right, I relented. Perhaps it's just that the sound of sirens rushing down the road interrupted me. They were headed west, towards the Gibson's farm. When was the last time you heard sirens around here, Ma? I asked. Five months ago, she replied. The reality hit me then. We lived about 20 minutes south of Albany, and I hadn't been to Atlanta in months. I was grateful for my online friends and having internet access in the first place. That's why I'm writing what I'm writing. Jonah, where are you going? My dad called out and hurried into the truck, watering cans still in his hand. Check in on the Gibsons, I shouted back. Damn it, you're gonna look silly if you crash their family B key because you were worried. Explain the cops then, I retorted, before slamming the truck door and speeding off towards the west. Melvin and Maya's place was a ten minute drive away. With the windows down, I heard gunshots halfway there. I accelerated, mercilessly battering the poor truck on the dirt road. I didn't want to be right, but sure enough, there were two police cars and an ambulance parked outside their house. I got out of the truck and rushed over. The law enforcement and paramedics appeared on edge. Their face is pale. What's going on? I asked, speaking slower than usual. The sheriff glanced back at the house, and that's when I noticed the smashed window and the torn frame. Some kind of attack, the sheriff informed me. It's a gruesome scene in there, kid. We suspect. Don't bullshit him. You saw it too, a younger deputy interrupted. That thing's a monster. The sheriff sighed and patted the shaken deputy on the back. We'll make sure someone takes care of it. A monster? I spat. You can't be using that word lightly. A big one, too. The deputy rambled. That damn thing took six of my bullets before charging into the woods. I didn't want to believe it. It's bigger than any bear I've ever seen. 
and I know for sure it isn't one. Who are you, kid? The sheriff asked. You shouldn't be here. It's dangerous. I'm their neighbor, I said, pointing back down the road towards my house. I gestured to look around back, and I followed the sheriff and his deputy closely. The Gibson's crops were torn up in some spots, uprooted to be specific. There was a trail of blood smeared across a section of the field that led to a busted portion of their fence, trailing towards the woods and swamp. I wanted to check for tracks, but I was no detective, nor would the police let me get close. I, I don't believe so, son. Couldn't find a body to tell you. I bit my lip, trying my hardest not to cry. I walked back to the truck and drove off. I couldn't hold anything back and cried for most of my drive back to my place. I grew up with them always down the road, and they were kind and gentle souls. It was the type of loving marriage I envisioned myself having later in life. My parents had finished eating dinner by the time I'd gotten back. I quietly scarfed down some food on my own before telling my parents what I had seen. They were upset, for sure. They couldn't find a body, my dad asked. That means that there's a chance they might be alive. I want to believe that. I do. But the amount of blood that was there, I said. I don't think anyone could have survived that. What are you going to do about it, son? You can't go and fight this monster or whatever that they said they saw. They were good people. I can't do nothing about it, Pops. Live a good life, for them at least. They definitely want that for you. A couple days went by, and I saw some vehicles pass our place to their property a few times. It was pretty quiet. I worked around our smaller farm and helped my parents bring food to the nearby markets. Eventually, their obituaries presented themselves in the newspaper. It was cited that Melvin, Maya, and their son and their daughter-in-law all died from a bear attack. This ignited a fire of conviction in me. I wasn't a sheriff or deputy or whatnot, but a bear attack was bullshit. I had to get to the bottom of it. I cared about the Gibsons. I wasn't going to give up until I found out what really attacked them. I drove to their property, much to my parents' dismay, and saw nobody was there. Someone had boarded up the broken window, and I saw a toolbox laying about on the front porch. I hopped the fence behind the house and saw the smeared trail was drying up. Something was off. More of their crops were uprooted. Whatever the thing was, it was here recently. I was also able to find some tracks. Hooves. Larger ones at that. Couldn't be a killer deer. I chuckled to myself. I circled back around the house and noticed something shocking on the side I hadn't seen yet. There was a fresh trail of blood smeared towards the woods. Who was here recently that this thing killed? I took a look and saw a small broken window that was halfway through being boarded up. Looking down at the trail, there were once again hoof tracks leading away from the house. I saw some torn denim, soaked in blood on the ground as well as a screwdriver. This thing ended whoever was patching the place up. I was too scared to follow the trail. I was unarmed. I checked the nearby barn that held their sheep and goats. They were massacred. The only remains of any animal was in the form of a rotting goat carcass that was missing its backside. In my disgust, I thought of an effective but risky plan. I took the carcass back to my truck and drove back to the house. Mom and Dad always were in bed early, and they were deep sleepers by eight. Zero. I did make an effort to be quiet with my sneaking as I looted our compost and added in some of the fresh tomatoes to my bucket of slope. I unlocked the gun safe, got the highest caliber hunting rifle, and loaded myself up with a handful of bullets. I grabbed a high-powered flashlight for good measure, too. The sun was still in the sky when I got back to the Gibson's place. I took the carcass to the back of the house, dropping it on the blood trail. I dumped the compost slob on top, as well as the fresh tomatoes for extra measure. By the looks of it, the bait may not have been necessary, but I wanted to speed things along. I managed to navigate the intact wooden railings on the back porch and climbed on top of the roof. I got a view of most of their field, which was almost completely ransacked. I took out the gun and waited. Nothing came for two hours. 
The moon was full with a clear sky. I didn't even need the flashlight I brought. Disrespectful as it was, I also peed off the house towards the carcass. That was not part of the plan, but a part of me was glad I did. About 20 or so minutes later, I heard something from the woods. I quietly got the gun ready. It was a bear, and a pretty big one at that. No bear could have done this, right? It began sniffing where I had peed, as well as the bait I had laid out. I wanted to fire off a warning shot to scare it off. It was interfering with the monster. As I prepared to fire off the gun, I heard a low grunt and snort from the woods. It was loud, sounded like a wild boar, but not quite. I heard the sound of something slowly dragging through the underbrush. The bear noticed it too and ran away. A bear was running from something like a boar. What the hell? It emerged from the woods and I understood why. It was a massive boar. I'd argue it was taller and heavier than the bear. It didn't have the thick hair your average feral pig had. No, it had a bristly mane but almost no hair on the sides. It looked like it had been stabbed or shot. Its hide had dark exposed holes. I could see from the moonlight that its tusks were stained with what I could make out was blood. Its bloated gut dragged on the ground and the thing wheezed each step it took. It reached the bait. Did it notice me? I took aim. The thing began to heave and hack. First, a slew of bile came from its mouth. It looked like it was struggling. Then something else came out of its mouth that will no doubt be burned into my brain for the rest of my life. A set of flailing human arms. They swayed as this creature heaved some more. More bile came out. The arms were hung up in its mouth and tapped desperately on the snout. Oh, God. The person it ate is still alive. I took aim and fired into its side. It gurgled and shrieked. It spat out more content that made me lose hope. It opened its mouth wider, and a slimy, half-digested body dropped onto the ground. It wasn't done yet. It shook its head and the arms that were stuck in its teeth flung away. It kept puking. A hammer. A hammer, a half-melted hard hat, and parts came out of its mouth. It went back to the pile and began to gorge. This thing was simply making room. No doubt, this was the monster. Furious, I took another shot at it. I got it right in the ear. It squealed and turned its gaze upward, its cold, beady eyes locked onto me. I slowly began to back up, reloading another bolt into the rifle. It snorted and roared. It reared up at me, its oversized gut weighing it down. It began pacing from side to side before charging towards the house. It pressed its massive body into the house and I could have sworn I heard some creaking from the wall. I took another shot at the top of its head. It drew bile, but I doubt it went close to the brain. It looked up at me, opening its massive, disgusting mouth. I instinctively gasped when I saw what was inside. It was glinting in the moonlight, the gem on Maya's wedding ring. My body must have moved on its own because I don't remember putting the flashlight in my hand, but before I knew it, I turned it on and I couldn't believe what I saw in the light. The ring was attached to a slimy, disgusting bile. I screamed in terror and in rage and fired a shot into this thing's mouth. It stumbled backwards, squealing and rolling. Its insides were still vulnerable. As I shakily went to reload, I realized I had ran out of bullets. Shit. The giant pig squealed and roared. It took a few steps and began to retch once again. It vomited up Maya in pieces before retreating into the woods. I could hear its gut dragging along the ground. I was distraught. I could tell through the disgusting, slimy body that this was indeed one of my neighbors. It was far more gone than what I can only imagine was the gentleman who was patching the windows up. I made it home, and my mind is still a bit hazy. I don't think anyone is going to believe me when I tell them what killed our neighbors. I want to call the sheriff, hell even the military over. I cared so much about our neighbors in life. I want them to rest easy in death. My parents didn't even come out to scold me. They must have really been sound asleep. I wonder if anyone else heard the gunshots. 
Our other neighbors are fairly far out. My ears are ringing, my heart won't stop beating, and my mind is racing far too quickly to fall asleep. I knew it wasn't a bear that devoured our neighbors. I wish it were so simple, but I wish nobody had to die in the first place. If there's more of those things out there, then I'm worried for us. When will that thing turn its attention towards our farm? I've been staring at my phone for about an hour now, ready to make a call. I'll be able to help them out just a little bit by guiding them to the newest trail of blood going into the woods.